Hello everybody, my name is Jean-Philippe Regis. I use they, them, and he, him pronouns. I'm the Associate Director of All Children, All Families, and we're here today to have an open dialogue about suicide prevention. It looks like our partners at AFSP are joining right now. They should be joining us any moment. Hi, Maggie. Hi, hello, hello. Thank you for having us here today. Absolutely, absolutely. It's really great to be here. You know, Suicide Prevention Month just completed, but we both know it's very important to continue these conversations way beyond that, right? It's important yeah. to continue these conversations. So thank you all for making the time and let's dive right in. Great, Thanks. great. Yeah. Would you like to sure. introduce yourself before we go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Maggie Mortali. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am a senior program director at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So just to ground everyone in the conversation we're going to be having today, we're going to start out by talking about the importance of discussing suicide prevention and really doing this in an open dialogue sort of way where Maggie and I are really going to talk some about the research and, you know, what we know, but we're also going to bring a bit of a personal lens to it. And hopefully in the hopes that that story, those stories that we share, folks will see themselves in it and it will help them during a tough time that many of us are facing. So we yeah. know right now, many folks, if not everybody all around the world are really struggling with everything that's going on between the COVID-19 pandemic and racial violence and anti-transgender violence. And we know that these issues are disproportionately impacting certain communities. So the Human Rights Campaign has done quite a bit of research on how COVID-19 is impacting the LGBTQ community, specifically um, communities of color within mm -hmm. the LGBTQ community. And so you may hear me use different acronyms and different language during today's conversation. So one thing that you may hear me say are, is the term QT BIPOC, and that stands for Queer and Trans, Black, Indigenous, People of Color. And what this research has shown for QT BIPOC folks is that COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting them. They're seeing higher rates of pay cuts, higher rates of job losses. And of course, we know the CDC is unfortunately showing higher rates of, of death, unfortunately. And at the same time, we're seeing hyper-visible racial violence. We're seeing the anti-transgender violence epidemic continue. And this is all really impacting our community. So Maggie, can you share a little bit about what that means? Can you ground us in the context of that, maybe within in the context of the minority stress model, perhaps? Sure. No, it's such, a, it's such an important point, too. And, you know, when we talk about suicide risk, right, and um, we typically talk about risk factors for suicide. So health risk factors like mental health conditions, physical health conditions, historical factors, right? Um, a family history of mental health conditions or uh, suicide risk. But we also talk about environmental factors and stress, discrimination, what's happening in this country as it relates to COVID and um, racial injustice that's deeply, deeply rooted in our, our country's history. Um, this creates a, a huge environmental risk that, um, you know, alone environmental risks are not uh, known to cause suicide, but in combination with other health and historical factors can really contribute to an increased risk of suicide. And I think what we're seeing in this country, too, with COVID is job loss and, um, and isolation, right? And so we have to kind of create different self-care modules that can work during this time. And so some of what we'll be talking about today too is really about how do we take care of ourselves in these, um, you know, all the time, but also particularly in these moments of, of what feels like real crisis. What is real crisis Absolutely. in our country? 
Absolutely. And I'm so glad you said that, Maggie, because especially during these times, I think it's important that we really take an expansive look at what we consider suicide prevention and take into account those environmental factors and how many of those are driving people to crisis points and driving them to consider um, potentially harming themselves or, um, you know, things potentially um, even worse, right? So, yeah. Well, and also I think we have, you know, one of the things that um, has been highlighted during this time. And when we talk about, you know, health factors, mental health, untreated, undocumented mental health conditions, you know, we have an access to care issue too. Um, And so, you know, when I think one of the things that we've found during this time is that um, the introduction of, of telemedicine and teletherapy has helped to actually expand access to care. And so now I think, you know, I would, I, I hope that this model continues because I think um, teletherapy, telemedicine is, is absolutely going to change the game for many people to access mental health care. But it, it's also about competency, right, of, of providers and making sure that they, um, you know, really understand the, the importance of, of suicide, you know, risk factors and warning signs, but also the unique needs of the QT BIPOC community. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm here today and why in a moment we're going to dive into some of my personal experiences with suicidality and experiences that folks that I've cared about have had um, with suicidality. And I think it's really important that we recognize that sharing stories can really save lives, Mm -hmm. right? And I think it's important that the stories that we share are also diverse and they're representative of the full breadth of the communities that we serve, right? So that's why I'm here today to share my story, you know, as someone who's Black, as someone who's first-generation Haitian-American, someone who's queer, non-binary. These are all identities that we may not often see reflected in some of the narratives of suicide prevention. And that's why I found it really important to, you know, really be vulnerable and, and have this discussion today to let other folks like me and all folks really know that we see them and that they can keep going. Yeah. And I, yes, absolutely. I think um, what you said about uh, storytelling is so important. So much of what we have learned about suicide prevention has is from the stories of, of people with lived experience or who are loss survivors Um, And, and that's, you know, what we know about how to prevent suicide has come from those folks, those stories. And it also creates space for um, saving lives, right? When we Mm -hmm. can talk openly about not just mental health, but, um, but, but, uh, you know, suicidal ideation Mm -hmm. and suicidal thoughts and really um, the full spectrum of, of suicide risk and, and mental health, it's, we will save lives. And we Absolutely. will support those folks that are, are struggling. And you said, you know, keep going, which um, was our, our AFSP's hashtag for Suicide Prevention Month. And that was September. And it's only a few days into October. And it's just, it reminds us that, you know, suicide prevention, you know, every day is, is Suicide you know, Prevention and Awareness Day. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things I'm going to share briefly before I dive into my personal experience is one of the things that many of us battle before sharing our stories is the fear, right? The fear of of the stigma, the fear of what being vulnerable, how those challenges, how how that may show up in challenging ways in your life, right? And I think it's important for us to name that, right? And to say that, you know, it it may be scary, right? And you may worry about how, you know, this may show up at 
at other points in your life if you share your story. But again, to the point we just made, sharing your story can save lives. Mm -hmm. when, 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 we, when we don't talk about suicide, it's not, to your point, it's not a preventative me a measure. It's right. us talking about it that actually helps bring it out into the open and helps folks actually feel like they too can keep going. So I'm gonna share a bit about my personal experience as someone who is queer, as someone who's black, as someone who grew up in an area and during a time when things were a bit different. Um, so during high school, well, actually before high school, I was experiencing a lot of anti-LGBTQ bullying. In fact, I was experiencing that bullying before I was even questioning my own sexual orientation, before I even knew it somehow people saw it within me. Right. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes you, even the perception of your sexual orientation and your gender identity, just being different, can make you a target for bullying. And for me, I saw my friends, people who I considered very close, turn on me very quickly. And the isolation from that experience was very heavy. And you couple that with the fact that I'm first generation Haitian American, you know, my, in Haiti, the culture is not necessarily one where, you know, mental health experiences are brought to the forefront and where things like this are spoken about as openly, yeah. right? So not only was I feeling unable to share the heaviness of the moment, I was also, afraid of the rejection I might experience from my family because they're very religious, they're West Indian, and in our culture, you know, being LGBTQ is, is not something that is often spoken about, right? So I was going through all of this really intense bullying, all of this loss of friends, and I didn't really have anyone I can share it with. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know... Any, I felt like anyone who I spoke to about it was a risk and I could possibly lose my family. I could possibly lose my safety. I could possibly lose my shelter. And we know that happens way yes. too often. We yes. know that so many LGBTQs, when they face rejection from their family, they end up homeless or they yes. end up in systems of care. And I remember one particular day where it really, it just became too much. And I remember going home on my lunch break and unfortunately I, I, I had a plan. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful that in that moment, I was able to see a vision of what my future could look like beyond this moment. And I thought to myself, if you can keep going until you're able to get to a place where you can be open about your identity and you can be who you are, life is gonna be different. Give yourself that chance, you deserve that chance. Yeah. And somehow I was able to listen to that voice that day and I pushed past that moment and I kept going. And it's not as though that was an isolated incident. It's not as though you know, one moment of suicidality is necessarily the end, right? Um, we know oftentimes that's something that you have to continually decide and continually say, I'm going to keep going. And I, I know there's something beyond this, right? And I just wanted to share that story because I think it, you can see how the anti-LGBTQ bullying and how the rejection from my identity, how those things really combine to create a, a level of stress that at that young age, I didn't know how to tolerate. I didn't, I didn't know how to get support. Um, what are your uh, reactions to that? And how does well, that align with what you know about the field? I, well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and I think I just, you know, I think back to you during that time, how impactful it may have been to hear 
um, and see someone who looks like you and sounds like you and is having the same feelings as you were at that time and experiencing the same thing, say that, right? Yes. So keep going. And so I just, I hope there's someone here today, right? That's listening, that, that sees this, that, um, that feels like, you know, they're, they're worth it and that, um, and, and how important it is to keep going. I, you know, what stands out to me so much is um, when you talked about that family rejection. And, um, and I think we've, we know so much about um, the impacts, the health impacts um, that rejecting families and, um, and, and just re rejecting sort of cultures have on, um, on folks uh, in the LGBTQ community, but, but, but even before they're, um, you know, even before they've come out, yeah. or just that, that deep rooted rejection, um, because there's, there is fear, there's, there's self-discrimination culturally, right? This, yeah. um, minority stress is, uh, is, is, you know, deeply rooted in our own sense of self, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And one one thing I really want to just quickly, you know, add is the family rejection piece. During that time, it wasn't uh, overt. There right. wasn't, yes. uh, there weren't clear rejections of my identity. There weren't, there weren't hateful things being said to me. It was a fear because I, I grew up in the church and I, I knew my, my, all my family was Haitian and I didn't see anyone like me reflected anywhere. It, it was more of a fear, right. really, um, of that rejection than that over. So I, I, just, I, want, I want folks to keep that in mind that even if you're not directly saying hateful things to your loved ones or to your children, if you're not saying accepting things or affirming things, it can have that same impact sometimes. Absolutely, and, and I thank you for saying that because you're right, it's not explicit necessarily. And it's, it may not even be things that people are, are saying. It's yeah. just, um, again, those sort of cultural beliefs that you're brought, brought up believing, mm -hmm. and then you're believing about your, set, your own self. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the, what we know is that accepting uh, behaviors and, and um, can be just as um, sort of intrinsic to the conversation and have a counter effect on those negative health outcomes that are correlated with with rejecting um, with rejecting families and, and communities and cultures. Yeah. So I think that's so important. Yeah. And another personal story I wanted to share with you, Maggie, that I think is really important to keep in mind during suicide. Well, it's past Suicide Prevention Month, but whenever discussing suicide prevention is how do we support others? So yeah. not only have I had my own experience with suicide or experiences with suicidality, I have had loved ones who've had those experiences as well and have had to find ways to support them. So I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to take mental health first aid training, and we can talk about that in a moment. And there are tools out there that can help you figure out what are the signs to be mindful of? What do you say in those moments? How do you show up for those people? So this was a time when someone who is So close to me. Sorry, I almost got a little emotional there. Yeah. Um, so, so close to me. Um, I was going through a really hard time. And they were very far away. You know, I was in Washington, D.C., and they were states away. And I couldn't drive over there. I couldn't see them. I couldn't hug them. And they were reaching out to me in just a, a really deep state of despair. And that grief, it, it was escalating, right? And then I noticed one day that grief went from conversations about that pain to conversations about what I'm going to do with my belongings and who I want to have my things. Mm -hmm. 
And thankfully, because of the training that I had, I knew that that was a sign that things were escalating and that the risk of suicide was escalating and could be um, could be uh, something that was really possible yes at that time Whew, excuse me um so what i had to do is is really find a way to push through that feeling and remember my training and i thought okay what am i supposed to do here i'm supposed to ask are, are, are you thinking of killing yourself? Are you thinking of harming yourself? Do you, do you have a plan? Do you, do you have a way to do this? I, I had to ask. Mm -hmm. And the answer that I got told me that I had to reach out for help. And I had to connect that person to crisis services and connect them to the help they needed in that moment. And to this day, it was one of the most scary moments of my life, but I'm thankful that I was able to recognize that and that I was able to ask those questions. And that person shared with me that that ended up saving their life on that day. And I just, I, I share that because, you know, when you take these trainings, oftentimes it can seem so foreign. Right. Right. It can seem like, okay, um, this is, you know, best practices and things to keep in mind. But when it happens to someone you love so much and you hear it playing out right in front of you, yeah. um, it's, it's real. And knowing what to do and asking those questions can really make a difference. Yes. And I think, you know, I'm reminded through this, the story you're sharing, I mean, we take CPR, right? Not thinking we're, you know, surrounded by people who are suddenly going to have a heart attack and need these life-saving measures. The same is true for suicide prevention, right? If everyone knew the, the warning signs um, that we were all sort of there and, and available to take these life-saving measures and asking someone about suicide is is critical to suicide prevention and you know i just want to say that um you know saying are you thinking about killing yourself are you thinking about suicide you know do you have um thoughts a plan you know, access to lethal means that is that is a life-saving measure and it doesn't put that idea in their head um it it shows that you are um, someone they can go to as a as a lifeline really and and that even you know if they said no i'm not thinking about suicide you know good i'm i'm glad but if you ever are if times ever get you know so bad um that you need help i'm i'm here i'm just a phone call away and i'm gonna yes. keep checking in with you yes you know and um and you know in this case they they were and you were able to get them connected to to the help and support that they needed and it's just it's such a, a pa i think these pa these stories right of sh that you're sharing not only about your own experience but your experience using those tools is so important to to suicide prevention so thank yeah. you for that thank you maggie and i know you know we're coming to the end of this conversation, but there are a few things that I just want to spend a moment just recapping. And that's just the importance of sharing stories and showing up for your loved ones, yeah. you know, and reminding folks that there are so many tools out there that can help you do this. That's right. It, it, it can be overwhelming and especially in the moment it can be, and the more you prepare yourself, the more that in those moments, you'll have the ability to show up, right? right? So I know, Maggie, we're going to be sharing a ton of resources through um, a blog post that we're going to have after this. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, one thing I'll say is that right now, if folks are looking for things, I know on the human rights campaigns, and we have a website that they can go to, um, hrc.im slash help. And what you'll find there are a number of resources that, to be honest, I wish I knew of when I was experiencing these issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wish I knew that I could look for help without going through my parents, right? That there are ways that you can find search engines um, that actually can help you find folks who have training in dealing with right. or, or serving LGBTQ people, right? Yes. These are things I didn't know then. There are online communities that are affirming for LGBTQ folks who are isolated in situations where they're not finding that support. Yes. And that's what I needed then. That would have made such a change. There's yeah. so much research that shows that, especially when LGBTQ folks are going through these isolated moments and they're facing all of the anti-LGBTQ bias and discrimination that having one affirming person in their life can literally save them. Yes. And those are some of the things that you'll find on that website, ways that you can get connected. And we know that, especially during this pandemic, that's really important. We know mm -hmm. there are so many LGBTQ youth who are isolated right now in homes where they're facing that rejection, yes. where they're feeling alone and they're feeling the stress of all of the violence going on. Yes. But there are, there's so many support tools out there. There's so many networks that will allow you to connect with people who love you and support you. And I wish I knew that. And those are some of the things that you'll find on that website. Do you want to share a little bit, Maggie, about yeah. some of the things folks can connect with, with AFSP? I mean, I, I, sure. And I, I think that's so important, the reminder that you're not alone, um, that there are people all over this world who just care about you and, and want you to keep going and that there are resources to support that. I think for folks who are interested in learning more about the risk factors and warning signs for suicide that we talked about today, AFSP has our website, afsp.org slash signs, and that has the risk factors and warning signs. And then we also have um, a crisis and support resources and information, um, afsp.org slash LGBTQ has that um, directed resources as well. And we link to your site there. As, so I think awesome. um, folks will be able to find the information they need. And we'll put these links up with the, the blog too. Thank you, thank you. And I hope folks got something from today's conversation. I hope folks remember the importance of sharing stories and how that can save lives. Yeah. I wish when I was a, a young queer kid facing that bullying that I was able to hear a story of someone who made it through and who dealt with that and navigated that. So um, I'm thankful for this opportunity to share my story. I'm thankful for the opportunity to remind folks that mental health, suicidality, it doesn't discriminate, right? right? There's no one group of people that go through this. You know, I'm black, I'm first generation Haitian American, I'm queer, and, and I went through this and I That's made right. it through and I found support I've found a chosen family now and, and I kept going. Yeah. I'm so thankful for you for sharing your story, for being here today, um, for, for, for living through this so you could share your story and help others. And I'm just, I'm so grateful for HRC for this partnership and collaboration. And I just thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, we're right at time. And I hope folks enjoyed the conversation. We hope you continue to engage with both of our organizations. And take care. Thanks. Bye, Maggie. Bye. Take care.